So good morning everyone. It's really, really wonderful to be here looking at your faces. Um, my name is Vanessa Onomesi and I'm the author of Dark Neighbourhood, which is a short story collection published with Fitzcarraldo Editions, who are a press based in London, in October last year. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about my journey to writing. So beginning doing an MA, as I said, I did an MA at Birkbeck, prizes, publishing, editing, and uh, the most, for the most part, I hope to impart something useful about what I've learned on the journey um, and to give you something useful to take away. Um, and hopefully some of what I've experienced will resonate with you. So while I was writing this talk, I, uh, what, there was one question which kept uh, coming back over and over again into my right mind. And it felt relevant to actually every step of my writing journey. And the question was, what do you do when you're not writing? Um, I've, I've found that writing is the tip of the iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg of everything else you do in your life. And not so much, well, the actual writing, yes, but also um, informs your attitude towards your own writing, which I found informed my attitude to the way I approach the publishing industry, to the way I approach an agent, anything practical that you're here today to think about and test out and speak to experts about. What I did when I was not writing informed everything else I did. A few things are else, a few other things that I now understand that are firstly, most of the time I already knew what was right. That knowledge would underlie any practical decision I made. Deciding what to do and where to go is a lot easier if you're able to check in with yourself. You know yourself and you have to avoid this inner knowledge being buried beneath what, on the face of it, might seem like good advice but not, might not be the best advice for you and your work. And you have to be able to discern that. I had to understand what I wanted, where I wanted to go and trust myself. I was once at a talk where an agent called short stories commercial suicide. And obviously when you're writing a short story collection, that's not what you want to hear. But at the time I felt that, actually no, at the time I was really upset. <laughs> but um, uh, afterwards I had to understand that for me, uh, it didn't mean that short stories weren't worthwhile, and they were wor worthwhile to me, for me. And so I carried on. Next, I'm not qualified to tell you what to do, and actually nobody is. People are qualified to give you advice and talk to you from their own experience, but ultimately you're responsible for your decisions. Um, it's you that takes the weight of your decisions, and it's you that bears the consequences of them. And as I'll say later and reiterate that it's your name on the book, so I discovered that actually in owning my own decisions and only taking decisions where, that felt right gave me freedom. There's a kind of absolute freedom you have when you know that you can own your own mistakes and understand that making them is part of the process of being a writer. So I might tend to spend more time on feelings and practicalities or psychology um, but I realise now that my attitude is practical and yes, I will reiterate that a lot. <laughs> um, it's my main tool, it's a universal key, if you like, in getting where you want to go. It's pivotal and it's totally down to you. So, beginnings. I won't linger too long on my own story, but I've given you the parts that I feel are relevant and hopefully that will um, come to the fore as I go through the talk. And of course, please um, uh, bring anything up that I might gloss over in the questions. So as I said, or as was in my bio, that uh, looking back, um, I see that writing began for me before I'd even thought of writing. So uh, when I was young, uh, I would say that, well, I've written it in capitals there, Literature wasn't my biggest priority. I, um, I did read, 
I would, uh, usually I'd take some books out or my mum would take some books out of the library after swimming on a Saturday. So I'd read uh, a lot of YA authors, Mallory Blackman, Nancy Drew, which is maybe an odd choice, but I think my mum, it was a favourite of my mum, so I read it. Harry Potter, you know, the usual. Um, I did come across a copy of of Mice and Men um, hanging around my family home, so I read that quite young and that's probably the first Uh, my first memory of really being impacted by a book. But then after then, it kind of all faded away. I was really interested in sport, really very interested in the natural world. You know, I mostly I'd read the encyclopedia, to be honest, and this copy of the Guinness Book of Records 2000, which had a glittery cover that I was really obsessed with. I was really obsessed with the stuff of life, what was happening, creatures of the deep sea, and perhaps that would, um, if you've read my work, perhaps some, you'll see that some of that comes up in there as well. And I'll read a little bit later uh, to you as well, because um, I feel it's relevant. I'm going to talk about reading as well. Um, music was a very big part of my life. I played a few instruments when I was younger. I really enjoyed writing music, um, uh, classical music, that is. And again, um, I'm bringing it up because it's relevant later. Oh, languages, of course. So I really enjoyed French. But as you can see, uh, English literature was kind of languishing at the bottom of my favourite subjects, just above RE. Studying biology, as you can see there, me looking at some bones studiously. And I went to university to study biological sciences. And for the next eight years, this is probably the only book I actually read. Um, and if you've ever read it, it's fascinating, but pretty dry. It's not, doesn't really um, hold a candle to Eleanor Ferrante or um, Hilary Mantel. But this is the only book I read. Um, and so I'll say here that um, I talk a lot about listening to yourself. Have you noticed? Um, I... My journey into writing came from the opposite place, which is why I hold it up as so important. Um, So at this point, I was doing things I thought I should be doing, um, other than what felt right. And it led to all kinds of difficulty and confusion and conflict and suffering for me. And I really had the sense that things weren't coming together. So I decided to move to France. Um, because I didn't know what else I wanted to do. But as I mentioned earlier, I like languages, I like French, so I wanted to go. And just before I left, I went into a second-hand shop and found a book. And I read a passage in the book that, um, over the course of a bit of time, uh, began the process, drop by drop, of changing the world I lived in. And uh, I'll I'll read the passage for you now. For if there are, at a venture, 76 different times all ticking in the mind at once, how many different people are there not? Heaven help us, all having lodgment at one time or another in the human spirit. Some say 2052. So that it is the most usual thing in the world for a person to call. Directly they are alone. Orlando, if that is one's name. Meaning by that, Come, come, I am sick to death of this particular self. I want another. Still, the Orlando she needs may not come. So I, I don't know. I think I might have heard of Virginia Woolf when I picked up that book. It's funny, I don't know why I picked that one up, but I did. And I read that and it seemed to encapsulate exactly how I was feeling at the time, this particular passage. And uh, I might not have remembered that, but I wrote it down at the time. So I've been able to look back at how impactful that moment was for me, because um, perhaps because I wasn't uh, somebody who lived in the library as a child. This was really my awakening to literature and what it could do and how it could so well describe someone's interior life. It can do many other things, of course, and it depends what you like, it depends what your focus is as a writer, but this is how it was for me. So I'm going to talk a little bit about language. Now looking back, I can kind of see that I, um, as I was saying before, a lot of what became integral for me as a writer, what I see as integral for me as a writer now, 
happened years and years ago before I was even thinking about writing. So thinking about my heritage while I was writing this, my mother is Jamaican and my father is Nigerian. And growing up, being interested in music, I was really, I really noticed the cadences of speech. Like a Nigerian, if you ever hear a Nigerian person speak, listen attentively. Um, I don't have a Nigerian accent, but um, there's a really kind of lyrical, melodious kind of um, tone to a, uh, the voice. It's almost, if you've ever played music, like an arpeggio. These are the scales that you have to do over and over again. And I remember it really noticing at the time as a child. But again, I wasn't thinking about writing. I was just thinking, I like this. I find this beautiful. And somewhere it was tucked away in my mind, obviously, because I'm thinking about it now, maybe 20 or 30 years later. Um, so my mother's Jamaican. And one day I went to my grandmother's house and she was standing on the threshold of her house. And she said to me as I approached her, Mi look fi uno leta, which roughly in Patois roughly translates to, I was expecting you later. And I remember once being in Jamaica and speaking with a great aunt, and she described um, somebody she knew taking their last breath. She was a, a stage in her life where some of her friends were dying. And she said, so again, I remember those instances because uh, I found them significant. There was something about the poetry of the Creole that was speaking. And obviously, I don't speak Patois, although I'm surrounded by it. So I had the privilege of kind of being an outsider to it. And I was able to notice the poetry of the words. English has its own poetry, of course but it's my mother tongue, so I don't notice it as much. And here I re was really able to, um, I suppose, get, uh, gain a relationship with language, which was to become really important to me later on. So in France, I learned a new language. And I'll say simply that letting go of one language, English, allowed me to take up another. And it also changed my sense of language forever. We're lucky to write in English. It's very flexible, pliable. You can push and push it, and it, you can remould it, and it won't break. If you're ever worried about going too far, just try. And also what t uh, learning a language taught me is a kind of inner feeling. Uh, often when I was getting better, it felt terrible. I felt like I was getting worse. And when I was learning to write, I learned to associate the same feeling of difficulty with progress, not with failure. Um, failure is necessary. Learning French was a process. You get, the la you get pronunciations wrong. I got sentences wrong, grammar wrong all the time. And over time, through doing that, I got better and better. And it's the same with writing. You get it wrong. Failure is not really failure. I'll call it failure for now, but it's not. It's just another integral part of the process. And actually, it helps with writing, especially if you're doing an MA or in a workshop situation, or if you're any, in any situation where you're lucky enough to have a captive audience, in a way it's a, a good idea to push yourself until it breaks. It's better to go do too far while you have feedback, and then you know what the limit is. What else? So lastly, I'll say, I'll jump to that one. The process is predicated on trust. Trust of your preferences, your passions, your mistakes are the right mistakes, they're the ones you should be making. A lot of anxiety, for me, that is, and the desire to follow advice that didn't actually align with me came out of forgetting that. So what do you do when you're not writing? Do you listen to people speak, the cadences of their speech, accent, intonation, pauses? Do you listen to your own thoughts? Do you block out the world with headphones? Are you paying attention to your own interests and following them? My confidence as a writer is formed out of how much I respect, respect I have for my own interests, ideas, sensibility, and my own process and de dedication to that. So I'm moving back from France 
again in a similar situation to the second hand shop. I was in a bookshop um, in a gallery and I came across a book of poetry. Again, I picked it up and I read these passages. This is from in the, in the Baggage Room at the Greyhound by Allen Ginsberg, and there's a picture of the book I have. In the depths of the Greyhound terminal, sitting dumbly on a baggage truck, looking at the sky, waiting for the Los Angeles Express to depart, worrying about eternity over the post office roof in the nighttime red downtown heaven. So I give you these three occurrences, Virginia Woolf, France and Ginsberg, as they are significant in shaping the development of my writing later on. It's affected my sensibility and preferences way before writing was ever a consideration. And looking back, I can see how these, important these experiences were to shaping my craft. So I'm going to talk about the creative writing MA. Speeding forward two years, I had started doing a bit of writing. I applied for an MA. Um, I applied to Birkbeck because it allowed me to work at the same time. Um, I didn't apply anywhere else. And I did a two, an MA for two years part time. Um, so some of you might be doing MA, some of you not. Um, and I'd say all of this applies, whatever you're doing. Um, but uh, what I learned from the MA is, uh, are a few things. I think the most integral thing for me was finding my supporters. Having what I didn't have before was a group of people who were also learning to write, with whom I could share work and give feedback and read their work. And this was really invaluable to me, partly because I hadn't read that much at that point and being surrounded by people who were really um, erudite, really well read. Also the thing about Birkbeck was that there was a really um, broad mix of, it was a really broad age range. So there were lots of people that I could really learn from who'd spent their lives reading and um, we all had differences in taste. What was um, current when we were, uh, when they were young, wasn't the same for me. So it was really integral, I think. But I don't think that um, you have to do an MA to find a group of supporters. It, as I said before, like what suits you? You don't have to, you don't, you're, they don't even have to be alive. I mean, I read a lot of uh, writers' diaries, for example. I remember I came across a copy of Steinbeck's diaries while he was writing The um, Grapes of Wrath, and it's full of just anxiety. He was always on himself for spending too much time at the rodeo, and it shows you that distraction wherever you find it will find you it's a writer's curse um, and actually reading other writers diaries was a source of support for me or um, uh, lots of writers have written books about writing sometimes when I'm in a low or fallow period I'll just read those and it's really I find it at least very encouraging and a, co a confidence boost um, to know that writers I admire had felt the way I did or feel the way I do about the craft. So there's some affirmation. Also, uh, Twitter, uh, you know, if your social media is your thing, it's not really my thing, but I know that Ellie Williams, who gave this keynote a few uh, years ago, talked about how Twitter was her way into writing, or at least into the writing sphere. Um, she was able to, you know, there are lots of people doing interesting things uh, which are just play and that's all writing really is. So um, there are lots and lots of ways to find your supporters. Going to events also, I have friends who didn't do any, haven't done any degrees whatsoever, but they're just through enthusiasm and going to poetry events, they've built themselves a network of supportive writers. Reading up other people's work who are also learning to write was really helpful for me, mainly because they can make mistakes for you, if that makes sense. Like when you're sharing people's work, you can learn from other people's struggles in a way that if perhaps if I were solo, I'd have to write two or three times more writing, I'd have to produce more writing to learn the same lessons. So um, listening to advice being given to other writers in the workshop, I should say that Birkbeck, 
the, all the um, teaching was based around the workshop. We did a workshop every week. Um, we wrote a short story uh, twice a term. So two people would be workshopped every week by about 10 people. So that's the scenario I'm kind of uh, referring to. And there, obviously, having read the work, if people are having difficulties handling time in a story, voice, narrative, you know, I could absorb it all and did. It was really helpful. Also helps you to take criticism seriously, but not personally. Um, sometimes criticism can be very painful, but actually when you're doing it every couple of weeks, you learn that to love it in a way, or you learn to crave it. You want something um, that can help your writing get better. Um, and do, it kind of reiterates, which uh, I remind myself of, that the work is central. It's not about you, it's about the work. So you do whatever's best for it. You listen to advice that is good for the work. And how you know that advice is good for the work is if it resonates with you. You don't necessarily have to agree with it, but I find that I already knew what I was trying to get away with. Um, so uh, ultimately, there's always a kind of sense of recognition. And if I'm not sure, I just wait a while and eventually um, a decision will bubble to the surface. So giving things time, taking breaks, um, learning to write by writing. The only way I really learn to write short stories is by writing them. And I'm often asked, how do you write a short story? Where do you find an idea? How do you write a good sentence? And the only answer I can really give is by writing. How else are you going to do it? I'm always confronted with the fact that I never feel like I know what I'm doing. I'm trying to write a novel now. And even having to, having, after having published one book, I have the complete feeling that I have no idea what I'm doing. And I feel... I have to remind myself that that is a good feeling to have because then you can have the most fun. So learn to write by writing. OK. Um, oh, there's one other thing about the workshop which I, I, I do want to say is that learning from other people's mistakes, yes, but also understanding how people read. Um, so my book, I'm going to read it for you in a bit, just so you kind of get the gist of what I'm talking about, but it's often described as experimental writing. And as a result, I really benefited from understanding where the limit is, <laughs> where the limit of a person's reading capacity. So instead of uh, trying to write, say, a story that might impress people, I use the workshop to test, okay, so if I um, remove these two uh, words in the sentence, can somebody still understand what I'm saying? If I move a comma from here to here or remove it, um, remove it altogether, can somebody, uh, what do, effect does that have on the way the person reads it? If I put a gap instead of a comma or a full stop, how does that impact on the reader? So the workshop was not necessarily a... Um, what's it, writing by committee, but it was more, for me, a test bed, like a, a place to take risks, a place where it didn't really matter what the outcome was. It doesn't matter if somebody says, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's the point of it. Well, that was the point of it for me. Towards the end of my MA, I went part time because I wanted to uh, give a bit more time to writing. Now, part time didn't really mean part time I, um, because uh, I live in London and it's not really possible to live on a part-time job. So I made my income up in other ways, but I had a bit more flexibility. So I was able to have the odd month where I was working part-time in order to write. And at that point, uh, a shift, again, talking about attitude, there was a real shift in my attitude. Um, I started calling myself a writer, magically. When somebody asked what I did, I, instead of saying admin, I said a writer. And I don't think it was necessarily because I ha suddenly had time to write, but I made the time to write because I was prepared to take myself seriously as a writer. So it was the other way around. So I'm obviously not saying that you have to um, take half the week to write, but I want to emphasize that that internal switch changed my outlook and it changed a lot of things I did practically. You know, I set, suddenly I um, set up a new email account just for writing 
And um, for about two or three years, they got no emails, more or less. But the, now it's full of emails. And I'm like, God, I thought the other day, I'm so glad I did that because this would be a hot mess. I have about 2,000 unread emails in my old Gmail account. So I got myself organized. Um, so in 2019, I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, and if there's anything more you want to know, just ask me. But in 2019, I won the Write Review Short Story Prize. Um, so it was the, uh, and it was with my story at the heart of things. Um, it was the third time I'd entered the prize. Um, and note also on timing, I'm really glad that I didn't uh, short, get shortlisted or win the prize the previous two times. Obviously at the time, I, I didn't think that. But looking back, I was like, oh yeah, the, those stories were not good. So I'm really, um, there's a note on timing. I think actually it came at the right time. Definitely with my story at the heart of things, I, it was a bit of a, um, what's the word? I'd hit my stride as a writer. And at that point, I was ready to go on and write a few stories in the style that at the heart of things embodied. Whereas previously, I was still trying things out and maybe I, I was a bit impatient to get somewhere. Prizes are a good way to achieve more visibility of your work. Um, a bit of money is always helpful. It was very helpful for me. Um, but they're not the be all and end all. Um, they're not, they're, and they're not a guarantee either. And they don't say anything about the value of your work. I say that um, although the previous two pieces uh, were not, perhaps were not good enough to win the prize or whatever that means, but that doesn't mean they're not, they didn't have value. That's two different things. Like, in, like uh, all the work um, I did previously was still valuable because it was part of my journey. Um, but a few notes on entering prizes. So this is a spreadsheet I kept. And saying I got organized, I kept a, um, you know, a list, uh, a few spreadsheets with tabs, one for entering prizes. So I kept note of all the prizes I entered. Partly because um, some prizes have caveats that you can't enter the same story for another prize or whatever. So I had to keep track of what I was doing, what I'd entered to literary magazines. And this was all kept in this spreadsheet here. And as you can see, there are quite a few no's. And even after I won the prize, there were still no's. But what I did, I think, in entering prizes was uh, in the first year I tried entering prizes, I kind of just tried everything. The Bridport Prize, the Manchester Short Story Prize, the Bath Short Story Prize, um, the White Review Prize. And then when I really started seeing who was winning these prizes and reading the winners and um, doing an actual proper research, I realized that as my writing was becoming more experimental, a lot of those prizes were just not appropriate for me to be entering and I was wasting my energy. I had to work, I, you have to write. And actually I wanted to conserve a bit of energy, but as little energy as possible into doing the admin. So I really narrowed down what prizes I was entering quite quickly. And also I just couldn't afford it <laughs> um, because you, you know, a 10 pound entry fee for each entry, you kind of really want to be focusing your efforts. So I narrowed it down to about five or three prizes every year and I just entered them year on year. Um, and I decided I was in it for the long game. And so that was it. After three years of entering, the White Review Prize was the one I won. Again, about no guarantees. So the result of the prize, the White Review Prize is now obviously a very um, prestigious, or at least it's, it's one that a lot of people notice and recognize in the industry. And a few agents did get in touch with me after I won the prize. And, uh, but I say it's not a guarantee because none of those ag agents actually ended up being my agents. I had a lot of meetings. Um, there are about five, I'd say. Had a few meetings. At the time, I didn't have a short story collection finished. So um, there was a period where there was a bit of encouragement, but most of them said, I'll oh, just get back to me when you're done. So I went away and did that. So I also say about prizes that um, they're not absolutely necessary. And also being published in literary magazines isn't 100% necessary to being pub eventually being published. As you can see from my no spreadsheet, 
Um, I actually wasn't published in any literary magazines other than the White Review after I won the prize. And then once again a year later. So um, by all means, uh, enter, like it depends really what your capacity is, enter all of them if you want. But uh, if you don't, and it is a real stress on you to be able to do it, then just remember it's not the be all and end all. So I'm going to read you a little bit of At the Heart of Things. At the heart of things, there is no meaning. Hanging a picture on the wall, I give a little too much force for my thumb, skin breaks under pressure, an orb of blood. Red, red to dark red, to dry red, to skin, to iron, to rust, to heat, to sweat, to yesterdays as we move, we move, Tuesday. Going into the city with the rest of them sliding down the grease pole of means become ends. Let me tell you. I slipped and travelled against the sharp grain of escalator, one flight of metal before I hit flat floor and crack. To the back of my head, I cried like a child, oh I, oh I, said me. I'm in pain. I was at work by the afternoon. At home by early evening, feeling burning scratches on the backs of my legs and the bruised curve of my head. My mind curved, bruised. I just wanted to make a little note on, I, I, I wanted to read it because I hoped it would bring together everything I was talking about right at the beginning, about music, about poetry, all those things that, again, were influences on me before I ever thought of writing. They all kind of came together when I hit my stride with this, um, uh, with this story. And also a note on reading as well. Like nobody really ever tells you that. You're going to have to read your work out a lot. Um, and it's a really kind of like, I suppose with the rise of the audio book now, it's something that um, you might want to think about. Um, I'm getting on to publishing next, so I'm not going to linger on this too long. But I will say that... Um, if you're publishing with a smaller publisher, you might, uh, if a publisher like Fitzcarraldo, they're brilliant in that I can do as many events as I want. They don't have a marketing budget for me. But even if you do have a marketing budget, that might mean that you get, what, three or four chances to read your work in front of people. And think about how, if you read well, how many people might be interested in your work. Um, I know my, that this work, my work especially, I recognized is very oral and it lends itself to being read out loud. So I really understood, well, uh, eventually I understood that it was really important to learn to read it well. And even if your work isn't that way, still it, it really helps. It's really, I, I would really say it's a good idea to, that, to practice how to read your work and understand how to read it. Um, it's really changed. It also just changes the way I do events and it changes the way people engage with me. It makes doing events much more fun, to be honest. Um, so, and it's something that nobody ever talked to me about so much or prepared me for. So I just want to add that note here. So I put together the short story collection. I don't know if any of you are writing short story collections. Show of hands, so I'll see how, how, how long I'll linger on it. Maybe I'll, okay, great. So in putting together the collection, um, I suppose, uh, as everyone knows, publishing is a business. And I think, with uh, remembering the commercial suicide comment, um, that short stories, uh, the tradition of short stories, as it is in the UK, has kind of intersected with the fact that we really, our industry really loves the novel. And um, so for a short story collection, like, it's not like the collections that I really love, for example, Borges or Cortazar or even like collected stories of Kafka, short story collection as it's published here is kind of an amalgamation between short stories with the kind of spirit of the novel, like uh, people ask you about themes and how they kind of go together. And I, I would say that I didn't give so much consideration to that, that it affected what I wanted to write. Um, I still carried on writing the stories I wanted to write, 
and I kind of trusted that they would be um, guided by a style. Um, so I didn't worry too much about how they would fit together. But it's something to have in your mind when you're writing them. I'd say, so this diagram here, after I was writing about the third short story, I think it was called The Winner, I started to um, kind of cross-pollinate or swap um, different phrases, images, um, bits of dialogue between the short stories. And this became my way of kind of creating a whole out of the book. Um, and I say again, like, uh, again to reiterate, um, have in mind what works for you. Like I, I wasn't really interested in having characters reappearing in each story. I don't really write to themes, so I was never going to do that. But this is something that actually really worked for me. And actually, I find um, it, if you end up reading it straight through uh, the collection, one after another, it enhances your experience of the collection. What I wanted or what I was hoping for was that the reader would have a little bit of a sense of deja vu. So this kind of um, recognition that, oh, I've seen this before, like a play character name would be a place name in another story. Or there's a line, or you can see here, the line down the bottom, too dark to see, deeper than black. Um, is a, it's in a, the heart of things. I also put it in the title story, Dark Neighborhood, as well. So that was the way that I kind of decided to link things together. And as you can see, I, in order to keep track of everything, I, put, I made a little diagram um, just to keep track of where it's going. And that's what's pictured here. I'd say that on that note, uh, and this goes for any kind of writing, novels or whatever, that I, uh, when it came to linking, I kept in mind, or I let the work lead me. You'll all have had the experience that when you're, you have this amazing idea, it's perfect in your mind, and then you start writing and it immediately goes awry. You don't know where the work's going. It's not what you thought it would be. And I have learned to follow that, follow the work rather than my own preconception, because ultimately the work knows better than me what it wants to do. Um, I kind of speak about it as if it's its own entity, and often it feels like that. So, and the story's always ended up, um, and I, I'd say when your work is out in the world, if you've ever had the experience of other people reading it, they always bring up things that I never even thought about when I was writing it. And I think if you want to maximize on that, just let the work tell you what it wants. And that goes with um, themes as well. Don't sweat it too much, but keep it in the back of your mind. And usually uh, you'll have an idea of what's best for the work in the end. Um, so keep in mind my boundaries. What did I mean by that? I can't remember. Um, oh, my boundaries, uh, th that's just simply, I'm not interested in writing to themes. <laughs> so I, did, I wasn't going to do that in linking my collection. And I stuck to that. So publishers, I'll just say that my publisher found me. They approached me after I published um, a story called Bright Spaces in the White Review in 2020. I didn't have an agent still at that point, so that was a year after I won the White Review Prize. Um, again, I still hadn't finished the collection, so I said I'd send it at the end of summer. So this was at June, in June. In December 2020, I sent the collection over, sent the draft of the collection over, and I, um, I, I still didn't have an agent at that point, but I sent it out to agents at the same time. I was also going to send it to some other publishers, but one of the agents advised me not to do that because they would probably want to edit with, it, it with me first. So the agent that ended up being my agent uh, was actually a colleague of one of the agents I'd been in touch with. She had passed it on to him to read because she had thought he might like it. He did like it and he got in touch with me and offered to be my agent. So it was a kind of um, uh, fortunate turn of events. And as I say, none of the agents initially got in touch with me um, became my agent. I also had a list of my own going of agents, mostly finding agents to contact. I looked in the acknowledgement sections of books that I liked um, because often a writer will thank their agent. So that's generally how I found most of the agents I wanted to get in touch with. And when I found that agent's agency, I just have a quick look at all the profiles of the other agents of that agency to see if there actually there might be someone a bit more suitable for me. The editing process at Fitz Corraldo, um, 
was actually very quick. I was offered a book deal in about March 2020, and they said, oh, it's great. I don't think it needs that much, so we'll publish it in October, and October 2021, sorry. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK. Um, went home and like ferociously edited and rewrote lots of the stories. I mean, I was like really, it was quite intense. And I, I would say perhaps if I were doing it again, I would maybe go back and ask for a bit more time or just to delay it by a year. And um, so I'll tell this to you now um, so that nobody makes that mistake. Um, uh, your agent is your advocate. And actually what I, perhaps because it was all quite fresh to me, I feel now I feel like I could have just said to him, hey, can you ask them to delay this? And he would have done that. No questions asked. So I'd say um, don't do what I did. Um, if you feel you don't have enough time, just ask for extra time. The whole process, I was not alone. I went through an editing process with my agent and then the editor at Fitzcarraldo. There are proofreaders, there's a typesetter. So I had all these in, this input. But of course, as I said earlier, it's your name on the book. So you don't have to do edits that you don't want to do. For the most part, I had quite a healthy relationship with my editor at Fitzcarraldo. There are lots of things where I was like, yeah, sure, I'll make that change. That makes sense. And there are some things where I really, really felt like I did not want to make the change. And those things I just held fast on. I gave an explanation. Other things, um, I didn't want to make the change, but I understood where she was coming from. And I suggested maybe if we make a change th at this point in the story, this will um, kind of fix the problem that happens later on. And it's amazing how the story is like completely interconnected in that way. Actually, the problem is sometimes at the, with the beginning of the story, not where the problem is showing itself. So what did I learn? Publishing is a process. Writing is a process. Your writing career is not one book or the second book, and everything you do matters. Failure as you perceive it matters and is absolutely necessary. The market doesn't necessarily recognize it, but you should remind yourself of this. And what I also realized is there are other ways to get work into the world. What a book is, is simply a way of getting your work from your mind or your heart to somebody else's. And if you, you're sitting here thinking, I don't really think like publishing books is for me, there are lots of other ways you can do it. Obviously now we have a lot of audio, audio platforms. Um, you know, you can exhibit your work, you can collaborate, you can, um, you can publish pamphlets, you can publish serially. There are so many ways to do it. And now there are so many smaller publishers who are w really willing to take a chance on doing something different. Also, something I learned is that bigger is not always better. As I say, we're publishing a short story collection. Uh, publishing is also a business. And I think I was reminded of this. Um, I say don't, also don't let that perturb you. But people did often say, oh, it's a short story collection, as if to say, so, you know, what do you expect kind of thing. Um, my agent did say to me at the beginning, oh, there, there aren't like 20 publishers in the UK that were published this. It's more like five. So, um, which in a way it helped, like with the, the prizes, it really helped to narrow it down. Uh, bigger isn't always better. Um, you have to think about, or you understand your writing, have a think about what, where in the market your writing would sit. And what I mean by that is, for example, my writing is quite experimental, it's quite poetic, and actually publishing with a writer, uh, a publisher like Penguin, um, although they did show some interest, uh, my agent actually very uh, correctly reminded me that do you want to be sitting on a long list of uh, books that are coming out that year, you're not gonna get that much attention um, you're not going to get that much of their time. Perhaps go with a smaller publisher who already has the right readership for your book. There are lots of people who are quite dedicated to the kind of Fitzcarraldo brand. And then other publishers also have a subscription model, which means your book is probably more likely to be read, published by a small publisher. The advances aren't as big, but you have to decide for yourself whether you're interested in a bigger advance or people actually reading it. So uh, that was a real key takeaway for me. 
And uh, I think it's still, it's something that's so relevant to you when you're publishing your second book, third book, um, navigating uh, the publishing world. If your first book does well, you're more likely to be offered a bigger um, deal. But is that the right thing for your career? I'm still trying to figure that out. I don't know. So I'm wrapping up now. Um, all I will say was, here comes the naff bit, writing taught me how to live. So taking responsibility for my decisions and only, make, only taking advice that resonated with me, even if I, in, I looked back and thought, you know what, I should, shouldn't have done that. The mistake was mine, and I think that making a, when you make a mistake that uh, you wanted to make at the time, it is the right mistake. It is part of the process of writing. Um, I'd learned to really trust my interests, trust my love of music, trust my love of poetry, trust my love in the, of the natural world. I don't think you have to spend all your time reading what's current. I really think I had to spend my time doing what I really like doing, because it all fed into the work and also fed into my self-confidence, which again affected what I did next. I'll just say that I really love artworks that are vital, not those that are perfectly written or seem to imitate life, but artworks that evoke life in all its forms. And this can take many, many forms, as many forms as there are living beings on the earth. And there is enough room for all of us. There's a documentary by uh, the director Fellini and in it he said, um, not to worry about whether something is beautiful in conventional terms, but ask, is it vital? And I really think that work is vital when you're listening to yourself, listening to the work, but also listening and feeding into the work, feeding the work with everything that you are and every, the whole of your life that you're living. So again, uh, the question, what do you do when you're not writing? And thank you because uh, writing this talk reminded me of that and I had forgotten it recently. Um, so yeah, thanks so much and I look forward to your questions. Vanessa, why are you drawn to writing short stories as opposed to writing novels? I would say that I don't have a particular, oh, as I said, I'm writing a novel now. I think it's just timing, actually. Like at the time, a lot of the writers that I engaged with first, you know, were my introduction to writing were short story writers. I think that I'd say that I really listened a lot to the New Yorker fiction podcast, and that is short stories. So while I was cooking, I'd be listening to that. And I, it was the way that I discovered a lot of writers, actually, because I just didn't know writers. I didn't know where to find them. So a lot of the real kind of aha, eureka moments or wow moments I had were related to those short stories. So I just sought to emulate that and ended up writing short stories as a result of that. And that's it, really. But after I wrote this collection, I suddenly felt like I wanted to read more novels. And now I actually haven't read many short stories in a while. And now I'm reading novels and hopefully we'll see, watch this space, writing one. Um, so yeah, th that's it really. Like I'd say also um, for experiment, obviously short stories are just easier because they're really short. You get a kind of, you get, a, you know, you know that at least by the end of the year, you're going to have written at least one short story. So in, in terms of, learning to write, I found them quite useful in that respect. So what was it that, you know, you'd done so many different things in your life. What was it at that point that made you go and do the MA and looking back, do you think the MA was the right thing to do? So at the time of doing the MA, uh, what happened was I, I was, I was writing, I was trying, I think I'd written one or two short stories by that point. And I had gotten a job uh, in a theater as a fundraiser. And actually I was really looking towards uh, film. I was thinking about documentaries. Um, it's a bit of a convoluted story why I got a job in that theatre. They used to make short films as well. So I thought I'll be in proximity to that. But the job was in fundraising, actually. <laughs> um, and it was my colleague, uh, somebody joined my team and she was doing the creative writing MA at Birkbeck. So I went from having no interest in, in it, but she was so enthusiastic about it 
Um, and I happened to meet uh, one of the tutors at Birkbeck, a kind of a barbecue she had, talked to her about the MA, and she said to me, just send me some work, you know, and I'll see. So I sent the work and she gave me some feedback on it. And I was like, oh, that's quite useful, actually. <laughs> like, it's quite useful to have somebody who knows what they're doing feedback on your work. And she said, well, put in an application for this year if, if you want. I think you'd have a good chance of getting on the course. Um, and I am denied about it. I tracked some other people down who were doing the course and asked them if they found it helpful. And as a result of that, I just decided, yeah, I'll do it. Um, I think what actually what really tipped it for me was just a practical thing. You could pay in instalments, monthly instalments, instead of all at once. So it, it did make the difference for me being like, yeah, I'll do this because I can afford to do it. I think if it had been like, I didn't have the money to pay for it all at once. So I think that made the difference between me doing it and not doing it, to be honest. <laughs> so with your master's, did you find that it gave you insight into the sort of business side of publishing? Uh, or like, if not, where did you find that insight? It did help with insight into that. Um, we, so outside the workshops, I should have said, uh, we had one term of kind of talks. So people from the industry, usually agents, sometimes editors, would come and talk to us about what they did. And it was from there that you, I was able, we were able to ask questions and we also got a bit of advice as to how go, to go about looking for an agent, finding an agent, and just what an agent does because uh, most people don't know, know or understand how that works. Um, so I did find it quite useful for that, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.